Yeah. I tend to look around too much. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Charlotte Carr. I'm the program manager of the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. And we're actually a research consortium comprised of eight universities, and there's a number of people tuning in online right now. So if you're online, I hope I'm unmuted and you can hear me. But feel free to type any questions in the chat box and I can read them out loud for anyone who's tuning in online. And we'd like to welcome Dr. Maverick Zavarin today. He is a Cal graduate. He got his bachelor's in chemistry and a PhD in soil chemistry. And much of his career has been spent at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And he's studying actinite environmental chemistry. And he's presently the director of the Glenn T. Seaborg Institute, which promotes collaboration between Livermore and the academic community in radiochemistry and nuclear chemistry. So, uh, okay, so hopefully the folks online can hear this, but um, that's my, the title of my talk is Determining Contamination of Environments and um, What's the Problem? And you could, you could um, <coughs> say that as what's the problem or what's the problem? Uh, the tone changes the topic a little bit, but uh, what I'm going to, uh, let's see. Um, this to work properly. Let's see. Oops. Mm. 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 Is it flipping? Okay, it's flipping on there, but it's not flipping on my screen. Okay, so I've given this talk uh, to a, a wide variety of audiences. So I think here we're probably mostly nuclear engineers, so I don't have to go through the periodic table. Um, but what I was going to uh, mention is that I am not a nuclear engineer. <clears throat> and so when I look at plutonium, I'm thinking of it from the standpoint of its chemistry rather than its uh, nuclear properties. So the rest of my talk is really going to be focusing on plutonium, uh, quantities of plutonium that have been released, the nature of plutonium interactions with uh, environmental surfaces, and really the redox chemistry of plutonium rather than any of the nuclear properties. So, uh, that's just a, uh, just to uh, give you some idea of what I'm going to be talking about. So, so I like to start. I like to start my talk by just giving you, <clears throat> giving a few uh, points to remember. If uh, if anything in this talk uh, uh, catches your eye or is of interest, I think these are the, the three highlights. Um, and I think they, they provide some perspective of, of sort of the global plutonium issue. Uh, so the, the first is that, you know, since, since the 40s, so about 75 years, in about 75 years, we've gone from an inventory of plutonium on the Earth from two kilograms, or that's a, you know, that, that number is, is uh, not very well known, but something in the order of kilograms or less to something on the order of two and a half million kilograms on the planet. So from the environmental rate of chemistry um, community, uh, there's an interest in defining this as, as a, actually a new era in, uh, in Earth's history. And they define it as uh, the Anthropocene. Because it's a really, there's a really strong shift in the quantity of plutonium in the environment that actually could be used as a signature for anthropogenic activities. So you could think of it as if essentially if you see any plutonium in any location in the environment, you know that it's interacted. It has had some kind of interactions with human activities in the past five years. So it's a signature of uh, recent history. Uh, and it's used for identifying groundwater age, migration of radionuclides, and the interaction with, uh, between the near surface and the subsurface of uh, The second point is that I'd like to make, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the history of plutonium contamination in the environment. Uh, and, and the take-home message is that historical releases, i.e., you know, 50 years ago, were quite significant. But if you look at more recent history, the releases of plutonium have been actually quite small. And the third point, which is kind of oddly phrased, is that plutonium transport processes in the environment 
are not unknown. And so in, in my early career, I like to preface a lot of manuscripts that I wrote uh, by saying, well, we don't know very much about plutonium chemistry, that's why we need, you know, you need the fungi and uh, we need to study that topic, <clears throat> which is what a lot of chemists do. But in fact, I think it's a disservice because it, it, um, it suggests to the community or the public that we really don't understand we don't understand plutonium chemistry. And I would argue that actually in the past 20 or more years, we actually have a pretty, it's not that we know everything, but we actually have a, a reasonably good understanding. And so I think it, it behooves us to, uh, when speaking to the public, to uh, rather than talk about all the things that we don't know, to emphasize the things that we do know. Because we do actually know quite a bit about plutonium chemistry and its uh, behavior in the environment. So I'll just give a really quick uh, summary of, of about something about myself. Uh, as Charlotte mentioned, I'm a graduate of UC Berkeley. I did my undergrad in chemistry. Uh, I was, uh, towards the end of, the, of my uh, undergraduate work, I actually got a job at uh, LBL. And at LBL, I was tasked with looking at selenium contamination in the Central Valley. So it turns out that selenium is a contaminant related to farming practices in the Central Valley. Uh, and it's the result of high concentrations of selenium that are found in the geologic materials along the uh, coast ranges. And that essentially <coughs> groundwater, uh, groundwater infiltration, the selenium migrates into the Central Valley and ends up having an issue a significant issue in farming on the west side of the California Central Valley. So that, that sort of got me interested in understanding how metals migrate in groundwater and how they interact with geologic materials. So when I switched over and did my PhD, I did my PhD in soil chemistry and was uh, focused on uh, looking at the interaction of selenium as well as nickel and manganese interaction with calcite. Um, calcite is a common mineral which you find in soils. Uh, and as I was finishing my PhD and trying to figure out what I was going to do next, I knew some folks at Livermore, and at the time they were interested in understanding radionuclide interaction at mineral surfaces as well because there was some environmental management uh, projects that they were working on. And so in 1998, I think, or 1999, I got hired at Livermore to try and bring the, what I had learned about uh, metals interaction at mineral water interfaces and look at it from, uh, and, and apply that to uh, radioactive substances. So when I think of radioactive substances, I think of them just as any other metal as a, a contaminant or an element. And so I'm not so worried about the radioactivity, although that's the driver for contamination. I think of it as just another element that's interacting with surfaces and migrating. And what is the chemistry behind that? Uh, so just for those of you that don't know about uh, Livermore, that's where I spent uh, the last almost 20 years. It's uh, one of the NNSA National Laboratories, about 40 miles to the east of here. Uh, it's about a mile, mile on the side. It's got about 6,000 employees, plus or minus, depending on how you count. It has a very broad mission of uh, uh, national security and, and science and technology. Um, yeah. Let's see. And so I, for the past two years, have been the director of the Seaboard Institute located at uh, Livermore. Now, all the different seaboard institutes, there's one at Los Alamos, and there's one at UC Berkeley. There's actually a new one that's, that's just uh, started at Idaho National Laboratory. They all have slightly different uh, focuses. Uh, the focus of the Seaboard Institute in Livermore is primarily to uh, build collaborations between Livermore and the academic community. And, and our focus is primarily on nuclear forensics, uh, radiochemistry, heavy element research, and environmental radiochemistry. Uh, and, and part of the, part of the um, reason for that emphasis on, on collaboration is that 
as some of you may know, the national labs right now are uh, are expecting a very large um, uh, a very large contingent of the research community or the staff to turn over as a result of retirements. And so across the national lab complex, there's a, a lot of interest in increasing collaborations as, a, as an effort to pipeline students and get students interested in working in the national labs. So we have a bunch of different programs that we're involved in. We have a nuclear forensic summer program, that's primarily for graduate students, but we also bring in undergraduates. Uh, we're involved in a variety of consortia, including the, uh, the one at Berkeley. Uh, and if, if you are not part of the consortium, that's by no means the only way to come and gain some experience at the National Labs. If you talk to me, I'm happy to, what, what I find, think of my role as a way to a matchmaker. So if you come to me and say, I'm interested in this, in nuclear physics, but I don't know who at Livermore is working on this particular topic, I'm happy to try and help you find the right people to uh, connect with. And uh, you know, I try and find money and try and find people. Uh, okay. So uh, that's my, my very extra long preamble. And, and the rest of my talk is relatively simple to outline. I want to uh, talk about the petroleum inventory on Earth, and I already mentioned it a little bit, uh, give you some background on the historic history of petroleum contamination, and then I want to give an example of a uh, site that I worked on for uh, quite a few years, in fact, for 20 years on and off, uh, and give you some sense of how these large environmental management programs work and the kind of science that comes out of it. So I'm going to talk about the management of contamination at the Nevada National Security Site, which is better known as the Nevada Test Site. So plutonium inventory on Earth, that's very short, uh, I'm doing a very short description, about two and a half million kilograms of plutonium that's been produced. There's about another 70,000 kilograms per year that's produced as a result of uh, commercial reactor operations. So the overwhelming majority of that uh, plutonium source is coming from nuclear uh, commercial reactors. There's a little bit of nuclear weapons uh, related plutonium production, but those are also extremely high. If you had, you know, ballparky number, you'd say about 1% of that inventory has been released since the So somewhere around 25,000. Uh, and and this, this slide that I have, uh, Electricity production is, is simply to say that, um, you know, nuclear energy production is somewhere on the order of 10% of worldwide energy production. And this is an old slide, so it may have changed. But, but the, the point that I like to make with this slide is that, you know, you could be pro-nuclear energy, be anti-nuclear energy. To me, it doesn't really matter. The point is that there's 2.5 million kilograms of plutonium that we have. Given its half-life, it's going to be on this Earth for the foreseeable future. So regardless of what the future of nuclear energy may look like, and it's anybody's guess, that the, the science that's needed to understand the, uh, the inventory of the actinides produced as a result of nuclear uh, energy production is going to be there for the foreseeable future. So it's not a topic that is going to disappear anytime in the near future. And it's one that's actually quite fascinating. So what I'm going to do in the next maybe five or so slides is just go through and give, give a sense of what kind of contamination there has been uh, on the Earth. Uh, and I'll just snap through a bunch of different slides, giving you some idea of the kinds of contamination so the first one is atmospheric nuclear testing. That occurred for about 20 years in the 50s and 60s primarily. By the end of the 60s, people smartened up and realized that maybe not such a good idea to keep uh, detonating nuclear weapons uh, in the atmosphere. But it took them about 500 atmospheric tests before they got to uh, figure that out. In that time, about 3,000 kilograms of plutonium was released into the atmosphere. Um, 
A lot of that material is uh, uh, particulate particles uh, of different sizes. And that's just one image from Semipalatinsk, which is a uh, testing site that was used by the in the former Soviet Union. Uh, by the end of the 60s, people smartened up and realized, well, maybe we shouldn't be detonating weapons in the atmosphere, so they moved things underground. Um, Two of these things. Uh, so the underground nuclear testing happened, uh, continued for probably another few decades, uh, all the way up to the 90s. And globally, about two and a half or 2,400 underground nuclear detonations, uh, uh, nuclear tests were performed worldwide. The US probably accounts for about half of those. <clears throat> Most of that was discontinued in the 90s. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily at the Nevada test site because that's a location that I worked on for many, many years. Uh, the NTS is interesting in that nearly half of the underground nuclear tests worldwide were detonated in this small area. In that area, just to give you a sense of what the size of the Nevada test site is, if you laid it on top of the Bay Area, it would essentially cover the entire Bay Area. So San Francisco all the way up to the, somewhere on that scale. Uh, there are a bunch of different uh, underground testing sites uh, across the U.S., but those were primarily uh, one-off events or very few underground nuclear tests. The overwhelming majority was uh, of those tests were conducted at the Nevada. Uh, and what we found over the years is that much of the plutonium migration of the Nevada test site, there's a, there's a complex uh, mixture of radioactivity that's present there. But the plutonium primarily moves on colloids. The colloids are these small particulate uh, particles that are suspended in groundwater. They're small enough that they uh, remain suspended. So they're uh, smaller than about a micron, and they could migrate in groundwater. So that's the primary mechanism. So that will be a theme that, that I'll talk about a bit more. Um, so another mechanism by which plutonium has, been contam has contaminated the environment is due to sloppy uh, production and reprocessing that has occurred during the Cold War. So that's primarily the, uh, the former Soviet Union and the US. If you look at the former Soviet Union, there's basically three, site, three primary sites where uh, plutonium reprocessing for nuclear weapons production occurred. That's the Mayak site, that's the Yavsk, the Tomsk. Uh, the numbers in terms of uh, kilograms of plutonium that have been released are, are pretty wishy-washy. The, the numbers are not very well known and not, not easy to come by, but the estimates are somewhere on the order of 16,000 kilograms of Mayak site, 300 and 850 of the other two. Uh, the Mayak site is actually quite a unique location. Uh, the contamination was deposited in a number of areas and in lakes and rivers that uh, were on site, uh, some intentional, some unintentional, but it, it, is, uh, it has been uh, identified as the most contaminated place on Earth. And that's due to the many activities that are plenty of other things that uh, have been deposited there. Uh, there's some folks for in the former Soviet Union that worked at this site looking at plutonium transport. And, and just as in the Nevada test site, uh, what they observed was that plutonium was migrating associated with colloids. In this case, it was iron oxide colloids. But the transport process is, is um, similar. Uh, so the US had its own problems with. Uh, contamination associated with weapons production. Although we weren't quite as bad as, uh, as in the former Soviet Union. And these are approximate uh, numbers for the releases that were made into the environment, not the inventory at any particular site, but the ones that the actual contamination. So release from some sort of confined uh, area. So Idaho National Lab had uh, quite a bit of plutonium. Some of that's been some of that's been repackaged and is eventually going to go, or has already gone to the uh, 
repository, Hanford had about 180 kilograms of plutonium uh, that leaked from these uh, trenches that were dug out of the ground. In the early days, the management wasn't so much of a concern, so the methods used to dispose of waste were uh, somewhat shoddy. Uh, Los Alamos has a similar problem, about 43 kilograms of plutonium that was distributed in the Rocky Flats and Savannah River as well as these small quantities. Okay, if you go at, at Rocky Flats, they've essentially, uh, this is now a decade ago or so, restored uh, most of that site to its original form. And, uh, so the, the DOE is actively pursuing cleaning up all these sites, and there's, you know, it's a very slow moving uh, process, but they're, they're slowly getting there. Hanford's probably the biggest uh, uh, to deal with. Uh, so just just as a, uh, to give you a sense of the ballpark effort that's ongoing, the EM budget associated with cleanup of some of these legacy contaminated sites is about six billion dollars a year. Uh, that was the 2016 budget. I, uh, I think a month or two ago, I looked at what the budget was for 2018. It's like $6 billion. So well, that number is probably not going to change for the foreseeable future. So there's a lot of different sites uh, all around the country uh, of various scales uh, related to poor environmental practices um, due to historical weapons production. Now, weapons production is not the only way that plutonium gets released into the environment. The atmospheric testing is not the only one. There's also uh, releases that have occurred from commercial uh, reprocessing facilities. And I'm just giving three examples here that give you a sense of how things have changed over time. So Sellafield site wasn't simply, wasn't only working on reprocessing, but they're one of the early reprocessing um, sites. And they, their peak releases were somewhere in the 70s. Most of that release has gone into the Irish Sea and deposited in the ocean. It's moving in, uh, moved into the Irish Sea and then it's migrated uh, through ocean currents. Uh, La Hague is a reprocessing facility in France. Their peak contamination was orders of magnitude lower than a cell field. They're a much more modern facility. Uh, they may be, their contamination or releases peak somewhere in the 80s, but they're much smaller quantities. And in the more modern uh, reprocessing facility in Japan, essentially, is releasing negligible quantities. Of so over time, uh, as environmental management practices have improved, we've actually gotten to the point where the release rates are uh, quite small. But we're still dealing with historical and releases. So there have been reactor accidents that have released plutonium, but if you look at it from the grand scheme of things, the total releases have been relatively small. The earliest uh, plutonium release happened at uh, a wind scale, actually on the Sellafield site in the 50s. Uh, maybe 10 grams of plutonium were released. Three Mile Island. Uh, no plutonium was released, although there's a melted core that had to get dug up and, and, uh, and contain the largest uh, contamination event occurred at Chernobyl. That was maybe 20 kilograms of plutonium, about 3% of the core. Uh, and the rest of the melted core is still sitting in a sarcophagus that's been covered. But it's, I don't consider that contamination even though on how you define it, whether you would say that melted cores should be included as part of the inventory of contamination. In Fukushima, that's the most recent um, reactor accident. Actually, the estimates are really hard to make because the amounts of plutonium released were quite small. The best estimates were maybe somewhere on the order of a gram of plutonium. Uh, was really and that's a very small fraction of the core. Again, they still have to deal with the plutonium that's in the core proper, but what was actually released due to the fire and explosion was quite small. That's not to say that Fukushima wasn't, isn't a big problem and isn't a big, uh, big issue and is not going to be a very costly 
site to remediate, but just if you focus solely on plutonium, the release is uh, I was gonna mention, I was uh, gonna mention one other uh, release event, and that's the one that occurred at the waste isolation pilot plant that's in Carlsbad, New Mexico. It's the one underground nuclear waste repository that's operating in the US. It just came back into operation recently. There was an accident in about 2014 uh, that released about a milligram of plutonium into the environment, and about 0.4 grams released in the uh, underground. I think the cost associated with that accident was somewhere in the billions of dollars, and it took about three years to get it back into operation. So in terms of cost per milligram of plutonium released, it's uh, Okay, so, so that's sort of a, a very quick description of some of the contamination events that, uh, that, that are, uh, have occurred globally. Uh, there is a, uh, a book series that I've worked on, and, and these examples are actually coming from a chapter that I wrote in this um, handbook. It's called the Plutonium Handbook. It should be out sometime this year, I was told. It's now up to six volumes, and I don't know how many thousands of pages. But if you really want to know something about plutonium, it's probably going to be in this thing. OK, so, so what I was going to do with the rest of my time is actually go through and Describe a little bit about how we deal with the management of these contaminated sites. And I'll talk about the Nevada test site because that's the, the site that I've worked on for many, many uh, years. And so, you know, the, these complicated contaminated sites are difficult to deal with. Uh, so, at the Nevada test site, you have an area, maybe the size of the Bay Area, just to give you some sense of scale. About a thousand nuclear underground nuclear tests that were detonated. You have about three thousand kilograms of plutonium that's dispersed over that area, as well as another forty-one or so of radionuclides. It was about ninety miles away from Las Vegas. And so the issue here is that, like many of these kinds of sites, is that uh, digging up the, that contamination is really not infeasible. So what a lot of these sites have uh, resorted to is simply understanding the problem. So, so from the environmental management program standpoint, they have uh, come to an agreement with the state of Nevada that they will predict the, the extent of contamination over the next thousand years. Why they picked a thousand years, I have no idea, but that's what they picked, because they had to come up with a number. <clears throat> the half life of plutonium is a little longer than that. But that's the number that, that's a rational number that they came up with. And they said, fine, uh, you've contaminated this area. Tell us what you predict will be the extent of contamination over the next thousand years, how you're going to manage that uh, contamination, uh, and how you were going to protect the public from uh, the migrating uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the task that the environmental management program. And I was gonna sort of, this is a, a bit of a sidebar, but, but in, in the uh, 20 or so years that I've worked on this project, I think that it's important to remember as, as scientists and engineers that there's sort of two sides to this, to uh, environmental management. There's, there's the scientific aspect of, yes, you can come up with a, uh, a, a maximum contaminant level and draw lines in the sand and learn models and, and convince yourself that you understand what the extent of contamination is. But a lot of these uh, sites and these problems are attempting to gain acceptance uh, with the public. And when you're talking with the public, it's not enough to simply say, well, don't worry about it, I know what I'm talking about. Here's the line that our computer is telling us. You have to convince the public that you actually understand the problem. And so e even if you're con you can convince yourself that there is no risk, that doesn't mean it it's, a different, uh, it's a different process to convince the 
And part of that is because there's, there's an inherent uh, fear of radioactivity and of contamination in general. So I just clipped out, this is an old article that uh, I was interviewed about. Uh, it came out of uh, the LA Times. And you can just see from the, the title how it's intended to uh, you know, catch people's eye, but it's also intended to freak people off. So the, the title is Nevada's Hidden Ocean of Radiation. So, uh, you know, as when you're working in an environmental management program, you're faced with uh, trying to describe to the public how uh, the, that you're, you're trying to define the risk to the public that's, uh, and convince them that, they're, that you understand what the risks are, but, but they have inherent biases that come from what they've read about. Right? Okay, so, uh, so what I'm going to do is try in four slides to describe how you deal with an environmental management uh, project. Uh, and this is a project that's, in, uh, that's expected to run for about 35 years and costs about $20 million a year. So in, in four slides, it's going to be hard to do. So it'll be very high level. So if you think of how you deal with this problem, and, and the goal is to predict the contamination, uh, radioactive contamination of the subsurface over the space of a thousand years. So the way that we went about this process, and the reason why I got hired on this project is we tried, uh, initially I need to know what are all the relevant uh, reactions that are controlling the migration of radiation. So the way that we, uh, the, the way that we, uh, uh, worked on this problem was we we relied a lot on service complexation ion exchange, which is a model that's used to define the interaction of radionuclides with mineral surfaces. Uh, we dug through the literature. We uh, produced a model with reaction constants that attempt to define all the different relevant processes that are going on at the subsurface. We then take those reactions and put them into a three-dimensional model of the subsurface which includes, uh, which tries to conceptualize the variability in the, uh, the variability in mineralogy, permeability, and geology in the subsurface. So I, you don't, I, these are sort of uh, pictures, don't, don't focus too much on the exact details of it. I'm, I'm just gonna step through in four slides with you. Right, so you have a bunch of reactions, you define what the subsurface looks like, and that includes the hydrologic, uh, the hydrologic and the geochemical conditions in the subsurface. You take that data and you uh, throw on top of it some kind of a reactive transport model right, that attempts to integrate the reaction chemistry, the heterogeneities, the reactions that are occurring, the hydrology of the system, where the water is going, put it into a model to, to develop a prediction of where the particles of water are going, where the contamination is going to go. And these are some, some streamlined models that we perform. This is a, the picture of an underground nuclear test, essentially, after it's detonated, it forms a sphere of contamination. Simple sort of thing about it. But, so what we're trying to do is define where these spheres of contamination, how they're migrating uh, down here. So you come up with a model. You take that model, you integrate it over extremely large areas where there's maybe a thousand, for this case, this is a picture of one area at the Nevada test site that has about 700 underground nuclear tests. For each underground nuclear test, you develop a model of where the contamination is going, you integrate that, you try and determine uh, parameter uncertainties, model uncertainties, heterogeneities, variabilities. You throw all that into a giant uh, uh, model and it spits out a family of curves. That family of curves gives you some idea of what the extent of your prediction of the extent of contamination over a thousand years are going to look like. You take those models, you cross your fingers, hope that the uh, 
stakeholders, i.e. the state of Nevada, thinks you know what you're talking about, and uh, you define, based on that, where, uh, where the contamination is going to be. And if you put in monitoring wells, you, uh, and, and you determine how you're going to monitor uh, that contamination. Or the next step. That's sort of how the process works. Uh, it, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's sort of the, the inner, the, the general workings. How this is. So, uh, I sort of give you a big, big picture of how the environmental management program at this site occurred, but I didn't talk about plutonium very much. So I'll go back. I'll sort of circle back and go back to this plutonium issue. I think. So in, in the past, it's believed that plutonium really shouldn't be migrating anywhere. Because if you know the chemistry of plutonium, in particular plutonium plus four, its solubility is extremely low. So the expectation of, is that plutonium will not, will generally not migrate very far. So it shouldn't be a problem. However, it turned out that in 1999, a coworker of mine went out and sampled some wells and found that, in fact, some quantity of plutonium was indeed migrating down gradient. Yes. And that's been now observed in some Russian uh, uh, sites as well. Uh, so it's, it was determined that most of the plutonium is migrating associated with colloids. Essentially, plutonium absorbs onto a colloid, the colloid moves down gradient. Uh, in 2010, we went back to a well that was even farther down gradient from that original well. We find now that maybe plutonium is migrating somewhere around two kilometers. Uh, and there's a bunch of new wells that we're drilling to try and understand the extent of the So what I point out is that in all these samples, uh, the concentrations of plutonium are quite low. So at this year 20-5 well, it was about 0.4 picocuries per liter. We uh, drilled another well, would be a half a kilometer down. That's 0.06 picocuries per liter. You go another kilometer, it's below. So the question is, well, is it actually a problem if we're measuring plutonium with those concentrations down here? Well, it depends who you ask. So the plutonium concentration is the maximum contaminant level for drinking water established by the EPA is 15 picocuries per liter of alpha emitters. And if you look at all the different wells that we've sampled at the United States, just put together this a simple histogram and say, well, do we ever actually see plutonium concentrations above the drinking water standard? And the answer is, well, yes, but very rarely. It's really only a couple sites where we've seen plutonium concentrations above 15 picocuries. So maybe there's no problem, there's no plutonium problem. And it's something that we've struggled with when we talk to the regulators and the public because uh, I've asked this question many times in uh, when I've given a talk like this one, and I say, I ask people in the audience, well, would you be willing to drink plutonium uh, at 15 picocuries per liter as to your drinking water? And in general, I've found that chemists always say no, and engineers tend to say yes. And I don't know what that means, but that's, that's been the trend so far. I think that nuclear engineers are more trusting uh, but the issue is when you're talking to the public, and you can try this, you, you can go to the public and say, there's 15 picocuries per liter of plutonium in your groundwater, you should be fine. Uh, that should be fine. And uh, it's, it can be quite difficult to convince them that that's, uh, that's a sufficient uh, protection or a, a sufficient uh, that you're sufficiently protecting their drinking. And really what, what the real question I think that needs to be answered to, to gain some public acceptance is understanding that it's fine that you're measuring these low concentrations now, but the question is always uh, what might happen in the future? So is, this, is there some reason why the concentrations are this low or could they, go, could they get higher or <coughs> get lower? 
And what's most convincing when you speak to the public is, is not to uh, tell them not to worry about something, but to actually explain to them the processes that are controlling the contaminant migration. So what's happening, interestingly, in this environmental management program that's been the most successful for gaining acceptance of the public is to actually integrate the public in the decision making as much as possible because when you when they are invested in the decision making they're much more accepting of that decision and they feel like you're not you're not just telling them what the problem is you're actually conversing with them and having them make the decision with you. So that's my soapbox okay <clears throat> okay so so this is my short description of well okay what why are we seeing the concentrations of plutonium that we're seeing with that? So I'm going to go through some, some experimental data relatively quickly and try and convince you that we understand why uh, we're seeing the concentrations that we're seeing and why we think the problem is not going to get worse uh, over time. So there's really three components that are necessary for calling facilitated change. You need Low colloid filtration rates, which really means you have to have the colloids moving. If they don't move, they're not, there's not going to be transportation. You need whatever contaminant you were concerned with, in this case plutonium, to have a high affinity for that colloid. So the plutonium needs to actually stick to these moving colloids, otherwise that's the point. Uh, and the other piece is that the contaminant needs to stay on those colloids. If it desorbs really quickly, from the colloids, well, it's going to desorb and the colloids might keep moving, but the plutonium will go elsewhere. Right? So that's essentially the recipe for colloid facilitated transport. Now, what I'm going to do is sort of go through some of these points and, and try and uh, describe some experiments that we've done to try and better understand uh, how these processes relate to what's going on throughout us. So the first one, the fact that you need low quality filtration rates, it actually turns out that, that the area where we see contamination, plutonium migration at the medical site, is, really, is, is a perfect location for college facilitated transport. The rocks are primarily fractured uh, rocks, and college migrate through fractures a lot better than through uh, porous media. And there's very low ionic strength, and the low ionic strength uh, uh, will help the colloids stay uh, suspended in solution. So we have sort of the two components that, that are needed to see good colloid facilitation. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about three, three quick, three experiments in just a few slides. One is some bank structure <coughs> experiments that get at what is the affinity of plutonium to these colloids. Uh, these flow cell experiments are continuously stirred reactor experiments that quantify how, could, how long does the plutonium stay on these colloids? And the third experiment, which gets at the how or what is how are those plutonium colloids actually um, how are they formed initially and why do they exist? Okay, so some back absorption experiments. Plutonium chemistry is actually is quite fascinating. Uh, and part of that, part of why it's so fascinating is because it has a really uh, rich uh, redox chemistry uh, and one that's been, uh, one that's been uh, poorly understood for many, many years. But I think we have a reasonable handle of what the redox chemistry looks like. So it turns out these are simple isotherm experiments where you, uh, you uh, take a colloid, in this case we're using mocha that's a clay that's commonly observed with the elements. And we absorb plutonium onto these colloids. And this is an isotherm where on the y-axis you see the quantity of plutonium associated with the uh, colloid or the mock uh, and the free plutonium concentration on the x-axis. And the isotherm, if it's a nice, what we call linear isotherm, you'll see a straight line. And this is a long, long plot that goes over many, many orders of magnitude of plutonium. And the red line is showing the behavior of plutonium-5. That's uh, plutonium-5 associated with monoclonal column. This is all pH-8, because that's the, the pH in the, the predominant pH. You see that 
Plutonium seems to behave very nicely. Uh, it's quite linear. The uh, KD, so the absorption affinity is somewhere around 4,000, which is pretty high. What's interesting with plutonium is that uh, it has, as I mentioned before, a complex redox chemistry. And so if, when we take a plutonium five plus five oxidation state sample, and we just let it sit around for a while, if you wait a year, the isotherm, so that's comparing the, the red circles with the purple triangles, we see that that isotherm actually shifts upward. And what that shift upward is telling you is that the absorption affinity increases. And what we know now, what, what's driving that is that plutonium-5 over time uh, reduces to plutonium-4 on the surface. And what happens with that is because plutonium-4 has a much higher affinity for plays, the KD goes up and if the, uh, the affinity of plutonium for that malt uh increases substantially. So it goes from a KD of 4,000 to a KD of somewhere on the 20,000 scale. Uh, what's important from that standpoint is that what we're, what we're seeing is that the affinity of plutonium for the color is quite but also that this process is very, very slow. So it takes somewhere on the order of months for the plutonium to reduce on a surface. What that suggests is that the reoxidation of plutonium on that surface, surface is gonna be even slower. And that gets at what the rates of desorption of plutonium from the colloids are gonna be. And that's one of the key ingredients for to see collagen facilitated transport is that plutonium has to stay on that collagen for a long period of time. And what we, what, what we did in these uh, continuously stirred reactor experiments is to ask the question, well, if you have plutonium, it's turned into plutonium-4, it's stuck on the surface of a collagen, how long is it gonna stay on that collagen? And the simplest way to uh, do these kinds of experiments, or a simple way to do it, is to use the typically called a continuously stirred reactor, right? You put in a, you put in a uh, suspension of colloids into a solution, you pump plutonium-free solution through it, and you look at the rate of plutonium release from these colloids, right? And then you come up with some black box or semi-black box equations to try and describe what you see. So these are the kinds of experiments that we want to try and get at. Once the plutonium is on the colloid, how long is it going to stay on that colloid? And this is the kind of uh, breakthrough uh, that, that we typically get. So you might have aqueous plutonium at 10 to the minus 11 molar that's being released initially, and then the, the aqueous portion uh, is, uh, uh, gets pushed out of the reactor, and then you get some rate of plutonium release off the colloid. Uh, I won't get into the details of how these things work. Uh, these experiments were run, but you change the flow rate or you stop the flow for a while, you look at what the behavior, what the release rate of plutonium is. But suffice it to say, you run these experiments, you fit a model to them, you get a rate of plutonium release. And it turns out that the rate of release is very, very slow. And that's really what we were trying to get at. Uh, the interesting point is the last point, if you see the uh, Wow. What I was going to show is, I'm going to click back and forth uh, in these slides. If you look at the, the breakthrough curves, these two, the axes are exactly the same between the two slides, uh, 31 and 32, but there's a shift in the overall breakthrough. The difference between those two experiments was one was done after just a few weeks of equilibration, and the other one was done after six months of equilibration. So there's something unique about plutonium in that the longer the plutonium is associated with these uh, colloids, the more difficult it becomes, uh, the more difficult it is for them to be So it turns out if you, if you wait over longer term times, you can come up with a model. And what that tells you is that the half-life of plutonium on these colloids is somewhere on the order of one to three years, maybe a decade or so. Uh, so 
that's telling you that once the plutonium is associated with the colloids and moving down gradient, it's going to take quite a long time, something on the order of decades before that plutonium comes off that colloid, which in some ways explains why we're seeing plutonium migration on the scale of kilometers. So on the scale of decades, we would predict based on these desorption rates that yes, you will see trace quantities of plutonium moving down. Uh, the last experiment, which I'll go, th I'll breeze through very quickly, is this question that we've tried to answer of, well, it's all fine and good. We think we know how the colloid facilitated transport is occurring. But where does that, what is the nature of that initial source of plutonium? So what we did was perform some reactor uh, car bomb experiments to try and recreate the conditions inside the underground nuclear test. So the underground nuclear test cavities essentially are, they start off at very high temperatures. So if you imagine what's happening in the near field is you have melted rock that was produced uh, as a result of the underground nuclear test. Most of the plutonium is associated with this melted rock which is really, we call it melt blast. And then it's exposed to groundwater at, at relatively high temperatures. So we said, uh, uh, since we were at Livermore, uh, and we have access to actual nuclear melt blasts from these underground nuclear tests, because they always drill back and characterize uh, the materials after underground nuclear tests. We can take those materials, Expose them to hydrothermal conditions and say, well, let's do a cook and look experiment. See what see what's produced when you um, heat these samples in the presence of dust. And what you see is basically four pictures. These are experiments that we performed for about three years. At 25 C, that glass, you'll have to believe me, is essentially unreactive. So over the space of three years, the rate of glass alteration is negative. At 80C, you start seeing some alteration of the glass. At 140C, you start seeing these small particles on the surface of the glass, and those are, in fact, uh, clay particles that are uh, produced as a result of glass dissolution. And at higher temperatures, 200C, essentially all the glass is, is disappears, and you're left with a, 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 a uh, clays and a little bit of zeolite that's produced, right? So, so based on these experiments, we essentially have a conceptual model of what happens in the near field. So in the near field, you have these high temperatures. Plutonium's associated with the glass. It's hydrothermally altered, produces clay colloids, primarily clays, and those go merely on their way uh, down here. Uh, I won't get into the details here, but in fact, in these experiments, we can, when we measure the colloid concentrations of that groundwater in, in the uh, reaction vessels, we get concentrations that are maybe one or two orders of magnitude higher than the, least, the highest concentrations that we see in the field. But because in the lab we have these idealized conditions, that seems to jive. Yeah, it seems quite reasonable. The, the concentrations that we're seeing here are in the same ballpark as what we see uh, in the field. So we think we have, uh, that's a little more complicated. Uh, <clears throat> so we think we have a reasonable understanding of the test site, not only uh, because we've measured concentrations of plutonium down gradient, but we can actually explain uh, how the colloids are produced the lifetime of plutonium on those colloids and, what, and the degree to which they're going to migrate uh, down gradient. So our, our relatively simple conceptual uh, model for plutonium colloid facilitated uh, transport at the test site is you produce colloids, there's some, there's some quantity of plutonium above the maximum containment level that uh, will be present in the near field. As the colloids are migrating, plutonium will be desorbing slowly from these colloids. And so there's a limit to, to the uh, distance of the plutonium, or there's a limit to how far the plutonium will migrate associated with these colloids. And based on all the data that we have, it's, there's 
uh, it's unlikely that plutonium concentrations will ever be higher than uh, the maximum contaminant level that's established by the Okay, so, so that's my story of sort of describing the conceptual, uh, our conceptual understanding of plutonium migration. Uh, and these are again the three summary points that I want to come back to. Uh, sort of the take home messages that you know, we have a, a very large inventory of plutonium that's going to exist regardless of what our you know, future nuclear power looks like. Uh, managing that uh, material is going to be an effort that's going to continue in the future. Uh, and that We've made a lot of progress in understanding how the plutonium is migrating uh, in the environment. There's lots more to do, and it's an exciting field to be working in. Uh, and, so, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, the one thing I would say is I did not mention at all the storage of nuclear waste because that would be a whole other talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Excellent presentation. Um, I just like to know how uh, how plutonium contamination affects sea life and life in the rivers and the lakes. And also, uh, if you, I remember that people, some people I knew and other 